All right. Um, Sabbath peace. This is another opportunity for us to come together and hear and learn of the word of truth that is given to us by the Most High God. All honor goes to the Father through the Son, whose name is Yahushua. In him lies the only hope for salvation. We know that it is obtained by grace through faith, not of works, lest anyone should boast and give freely as a gift to all who obey him. We understand that if we do not obey him, it is made manifest or made obvious that we do not believe. In this state, we should expect no good thing from the Most High. However, anything that we do get, whether it be a gift of tongues or a gift of prophecy or any supernatural experience that we may have, it can and it will be used against us in the day of judgment. With that said, peace to the saints that are in the room, to the saints that are watching the end, to the saints that couldn't make it. But no peace to the wicked. The only thing we say to them is repent that they might live. Let's open up to uh, John chapter 7, verse 14. John chapter 7, verse 14. Now about the midst of the feast, Yahushua went up into the temple and taught. And the Jews marveled, saying, How knoweth this man letters, having never learned? Mm -hmm. So they wanted to know. It's like, how in the world did this man know the scriptures and he never learned them? Obviously he did. Yahushua answered them and said, my doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. Mm -hmm. If any man will do his will, he shall know the doctrine know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. Mm -hmm. He that speaks of himself seeks his own glory, but he that seeks his glory that sent seeks his glory that sent him, the same is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. All right. So he's looking at whose glory are you seeking? All right. If you seek your own glory, I mean, that's that's what you got. He said, but if you seek the glory of the one who sent us. You know what I'm saying? And that, that, that's, that's when you, no, righteous, no unrighteousness can be found in you. And he's saying the way that you'll know whose doctrine you're following is by you following the will of the Father. Right? If you do what the Most High God says and you follow the things that you do understand, that's how you understand whose who's doctrine you're following. All right? So when we come and we learn, get your hand out your mouth, boy. When you come and we learn and we, we, we hear these things out of the book or we hear other people talk about God, sometimes it can get confusing trying to determine is what they're saying true or uh, is, that, is that found in the Bible? Is it the correct way to believe? Should we do this or shouldn't we do that? And, but it all comes from us obeying what we do know about God, what we have seen and what we have learned about God. Once we have that obedience, then he reveals the other things to us. That's why he says those who do the will of the Father will know whose doctrine this is. Let's go ahead and open up. We are going to start Revelation. So we ended Acts a couple of weeks ago. We're going to start in Revelation and try to get an understanding of, of uh, the back of the book and, and how it relates to the rest of the book. I was talking to a Christian dude at, um, uh, at work. I was telling him, I was just like, yeah, I have Bible study in my house, and you know what I'm saying, uh, we uh, we are uh, finishing up Acts and jumping into Revelations, and he like, he like said to me, he's like, oh, Revelations, he's like, oh, that's, that's a heavy book. I was like, yeah, it could be, it could be, and I definitely, I definitely felt that way for a lot of my life. I was like, but what it turns out is Revelations is, it's a, uh, it's a part of the book that as long as you understand a lot of prophecy and you understand you, you're familiar with the rest of the book and or the history and the symbolism that's been used throughout the book, it becomes way less intimidating. In fact, once you get familiar with all of us of the book, you think really it's like Isaiah, Jeremiah, you know what I'm saying? These prophet books, these are ones like Ezekiel, these is intimidating, you know what I'm saying? Daniel, you know what I'm saying? Like all this, that's intimidating. Revelation's almost like, all right. Thank you. You know what I'm saying? Like, thanks for, you know what I'm saying, taking it easy. You know what I'm saying? So it's, um, it's uh, the goal that we'll do is, to, you know what I'm saying, we all have felt like he felt, you know what I'm saying, but to try to, like, try to make sure our, that we can connect the themes of the book to make it a, more, a little bit more comfortable for us. And, and um, the, the goal is for it to give us hope. You know what I'm saying? We, we, should, we should have fear uh, that of the things that are coming, but... Only fear in God in the sense that we know that that if we don't obey, if we don't line up with what he's given us, then these are the things that we can look forward to. But at the same time, we look at the same same type of events and looking at what's going to happen in the end, and it should give us hope. Right? It should, we should be able to look at it and say, thank the Most High God for it. 
thank the most high God for the, the little bit of understanding that he's given to us before these things kind of kind of happen, that we can know what's expected. And as we see him, the only thing we can say is the most high God is real. You know what I'm saying? Just to, just to be able to witness some of these things. So we, we, we pray that he give us mercy through these times. But let's go ahead and take a look at this. Revelation chapter 1. Let me start at the first chapter, uh, first verse. It's Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. The way the books start off is important. Because it, uh, it kind of lets you know what you'll be reading through the, the, the whole chapter, through uh, the whole book. It's Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. The revelation of Yahushua, the Messiah. All right, so this is the revelation of Yahushua, the Messiah. Messiah means what? Anointed. Anointed, right? So this is Yahushua, the anointed, right? Which the symbolism of anointed comes from what? King. King, right? Anointed. What does anointed mean? To be chosen as king by the Most High. That's the symbolism, but what does it actually mean? To be like to apply something. Right, yeah. So, you know, we use it in the sense of pouring something on somebody. Like we, we would take oil um, for uh, like kings or uh, certain people of prestige that God recognized and it, we'd pour oil on them. Pouring that oil on them, you know what I'm saying? That recognized them as being someone that was anointed by God. So you would think of King Saul, which was our first king. He had oil poured on him and he was the Lord's anointed. Then later, David was the Lord's anointed. You know what I'm saying? Oil was poured on him. You know what I'm saying? And then uh, same thing with David's son, Solomon. He was the anointed, oil was poured on him. So this that's what when when we're familiar with the history, it means more than just Messiah or Christ or anointed for us. We know that this is representing someone who's being chosen by God. That's what it means when he's saying anointed. Um, and then the symbolism of that is each of our kings uh, that were chosen by God initially, they had same symbolism of you know being anointed, having something poured on. You know what I'm saying? So this is Yahushua. This is the revelation. That means something is going to be revealed of Yahushua, the anointed. Which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. So things which must shortly come to pass. So stuff that's about to happen real quick. Keep going. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. Uh-huh. Who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Yahushua the Messiah and of all things that he saw. Uh huh. Blessed is he that he that reads, and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. Oh, we got grab uh, grab Mark chapter thirteen verse one. Mark chapter 13, verse 1. And as he went out of the temple, one of his disciples said unto him, Master, see what manner of stones and what buildings are here. And Yahushua answered and said unto him, See thou these great buildings? There shall not be left one stone upon another. So you know how he said, that, down. he said that there are things that, he said these are the revelation of Yahushua the anointed, and these are things that must quickly come to pass. So this is, this is in Matthew. These are some of the things that Yahushua revealed that... Mark. I'm sorry, Mark, and this is some of the things that um, Yahushua revealed that would quickly come to pass. Keep going. He doesn't really know. This is, he's revealing it in Mark, but we're about to relate some of the stuff that happens in Revelation to what he's talking about in Mark. And as he sat up, oh wait, and as he sat upon the Mount of Olives over against the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign when all these things shall be fulfilled? Mm -hmm. And Yahshua answered them, began to say, Take heed, lest any man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am the Messiah, and shall deceive many. Mm -hmm. And when ye shall hear the, of wars and rumors of wars, be ye not troubled, for such things must needs be, but the end shall not be yet. Mm -hmm. 
For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against ki kingdom, and there shall be earthquakes in diverse places, and there shall be famines and troubles. There are these are the beginning of sorrows. Mm -hmm. But take so notice that he that. said these are the beginning of sorrows. When you have earthquakes, you have famines in diverse places. He says this is just the beginning of the sorrows. So it's the beginning of the end. All right, this is just the kiss. Just now kicking off if that happens. Keep going. But take heed to yourselves, for they sh shall deliver you up to councils and the synagogues. Ye shall be beaten. Mm -hmm. Ye shall be brought before rulers and kings for my sake for testimony against them. Mm -hmm. and, the aim and the gospel must be first published among all nations. All right, so now he's talking about things that are quickly coming to pass. So those are things that are going to come up right away where they have to preach the word, they're going to be taken, and he said, but all this stuff, what, happened, has to have, what has to happen first before the end come, the gospel has to be preached to everywhere. So he's first now giving them things that's going to immediately happen. He's answering, answering multiple questions right now. So keep going. But when they shall lead you and deliver you up, take no thought beforehand what you shall speak, neither mm -hmm. do ye premeditate. But whatsoever shall be given you in that hour, that speak ye, for it is not ye that speak, but the Holy Ghost. Now the, bro now the brother shall betray the brother to death, and the father the son, and children shall rise up against their parents, and shall cause them to be put to death. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. But when ye shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing where it ought not, let him that reads understand. Let them that be in Judah flee to the mountains. And let him that is on the one housetop not go down into the house, neither enter therein to take anything out of his house. All right, so now he's warning them about when the Romans came to take over our land. He said, when they circle in our land, notice that that's what Daniel the prophet was talking about. All right, and then he is saying, after that, and you see that happening. If you in the house, get your butt out. I mean, don't, you, don't be trying to go back in and grab nothing. You know what I'm saying? He's just letting you know, get out of Dodge because it's about to go down. All right, so these are things that pretty immediately after his death happened already. Keep going. And let him that is on the housetop not go down into the house, neither enter therein to take anything out of his house. And let him that is in the field not turn back again for to take up his garment. But woe to them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. And pray ye that your flight be not in the winter. All right. A lot of people confuse what he's saying now for like end of the world prophecy. All right. And it's important that we don't confuse that. Notice, why would he tell you if it's end of the world, everybody's about to die. Why would he tell you woe to those who give suck? Like woe to those who have babies. All right. If it's end of the world, everybody's going to die anyway. What does it matter? Right. Why would he tell you don't go back in the house, just run? Everybody about to die anyway. Right, he's not talking about the end of the world at this point. He's talking about when the Romans conquered. Well, now they already conquered it, but when the Romans pretty much just desolated our land and began to take our people into captivity and kill us. Some of our people escaped. There were, there were a chosen few of our people prophesied by Ezekiel that would, um, that would be uh, sprinkled into, you know what I'm saying, into the wilderness. And that's pretty much what, what the people who escaped, who he, he's instructing right now, get away. Those people who go into the wilderness. Bad butt. For in those days shall be affliction, such, such as was not from the beginning of the creation which God created, and unto this time neither shall be. And except that the Lord hath shortened those days, no flesh should be saved. Mm -hmm. But for the elect's sake, whom he hath chosen, he hath shortened the days. Mm -hmm. and then if any man shall say to you, Lo, here is the Christ, or he is there. Believe him not. All right, so they running around now talking about, look, Yahushua going to come back here. He's over here. I saw Jesus in the cereal can, and all these, like the Catholics be doing, you know what I'm saying? All this stuff. He said, what whatever, what, what you supposed to say to him? You supposed to pay attention to him or no? If any man shall say to you, lo, here is the Christ, or lo, he is there, believe him not. He said, believe him not. Keep going. For false Christ and false prophet shall arise and shall show signs and wonders to seduce, mm -hmm. if it were possible, even the elect. What do we know about Yahushua, though? Let's see. But take ye heed. Behold, I have foretold you of all these things, of all things. But in those days after that tribulation, the sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. Mm -hmm. The stars of heaven shall fall, and the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken. 
Mm-hmm. Then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. Mm-hmm. Then shall he send his angels and shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from the uttermost part of the earth to the uttermost part of heaven. Mm-hmm. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. What verse is that? 28. 28. Let's hear the parable of the fig tree, too. So, But you see, he went on now, and he is like, now in those days, he started to talk about the day of the Lord. The sun going to be dark. All right? Moon not going to give his light. After that, you're going to see the Son of Man. He tried to make the point. When these people running their mouth talking about, here's Christ, he's over here, come follow him over here. Here go the Messiah, I found him. He's like, oh, don't believe that. Everybody's going to see me. All right? Here's just, everything going to be dark, and the only thing you're going to see in the sky is the sun. All right? The S O N. All right? You're going to see the sun up there, and then you're going to be able to see him. Like, Everybody's going to see me. In another place, he'll tell you, just like lightning is seen. You know what I'm saying? He's another place to tell you, um, he's like, uh, Wherever the boat was, the eagles, but pretty much whenever, wherever the vultures are, that's where you know the dead carcass is. You know what I'm saying? And so he's representing the dead body. He's saying, you're going to know exactly. Every, just like a vulture, you're going to be able to find me. That's how everybody else going to be able to find me. Everybody's going to know where I am. So he's trying to make sure that we don't get confused. Then he goes on to talk about a parable of the fig tree. Now watch this. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When her branch is yet tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So ye in like manner, when you shall see these things come to pass, know that it is near, even at the doors. All right. Verily I say unto you that this generation shall not pass till all these things be done. Mm -hmm. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. All right. So now he's looking and he's, he's letting us know the purpose of me telling you these things is that you can know that these things are near. He said this generation that sees these things will not pass. Like it's going to happen when you guys see all this stuff. The, when the person see the last thing that happens, that generation ain't going to pass before that thing happens. Like, everything I just told you, when it happens, when you see this stuff, it's over. Like, that's it. You know what I'm saying? So now it's like, just keep your eyes open. He's saying, if you see, if you can look at a fig tree and you know that it's summer because of the fig tree, this is how you know where we are. Because remember, they asked him a question. The, you know what I'm saying? Don't you see this beautiful building? Y'all was like, man, time going to come. That building, that thing going to be gone. And so they asked him. Tell us about that. And when is the end of the world? Like, when is that going to happen? When is this, this, this building going to be gone? And when is going to be the end of the world? All right? So that's what he answered. He's like, well, y'all remember Daniel the prophet? He said the desolation, a whole bunch of people going to be surrounding us. That's when he was telling them that the building was going to be destroyed. He answered that question. He, told, he described that event to him. He's like, listen, when they come, y'all just get out of Dodge. If you got a baby, man, woe unto you in that day. You know what I'm saying? You in, you in the house, don't turn around trying to grab nothing out the house. Just go. You know what I'm saying? You in the field, don't be trying to grab nothing. Just go. Just get out of there. Get out of Dodge. Flee towards the mountains. Hopefully it's not a Sabbath day. Right? And so he's giving them advice. That's what's going to happen when that building is, when our temple is. Then he started asking the second question, or second one of the second questions, because it was like a two-part. One of the second questions was, when is the end of the world going to be? So he started giving them about the end of the world. This is how it's going to look. People are going to start doing this. You're going to start noticing rumors of wars and all these things. And so he, he answers those questions for him. Then he gives the parable of the fig tree. This is how you have to look at these things. This is why we read in Revelation. Let's finish this out, though. What's the last verse? 37? Let's finish it out. But of that day and that hour knows no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. He said, not even the son knows that day or that hour, right? But we do know the season, all right? The season, of the, the, uh, the, the season is a point in time, so the time frame that it might have. Exactly, you know what I'm saying? But we don't know the day or the hour, neither does the son at that point, he said, all right? So now this is what we have to do. When we look at our seasons, we had to, we had to try to figure out, just like the fig tree, you know what I'm saying? The figs are growing. This is time for the harvest, right? This is how we figured out all of our information. So he's trying to tell us this is the same thing. I'm giving you all these signs. Watch the signs. By watching the signs, you know what's coming. You know what I'm saying? You'll, know, you'll be prepared. Let's keep going. For the Son of Man is a man taking a far journey who left his house. Take ye heed, watch and pray, for ye know not when the time is. Mm -hmm. For the Son of Man is a man taking a journey, who 
who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to every man his work and commanded the porter to watch. Mm -hmm. Watch ye therefore, for you know not when the master of the house comes at even or at midnight or at the, or at the cock crowing or in the morning. All right. That's coming suddenly, he finds you sleeping. So, go ahead. And what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. All right, so he's saying, it's just like, he says, me, I'm, I'm going to be just like a, a master who owns this whole, you know, this whole factory. And I'm leaving, and I left y'all in charge. You know what I'm saying? Y'all take care of business. And he's saying, when I come back, things should be running the way I need them to be running. Otherwise, people getting fired. So he's saying, watch, pay attention. You know what I'm saying? Dude, watch, watch for things and be ready for when I come back. That's it? Mm -hmm. All right, let's go back to Revelation 1. Revelation 1.1. 1, 1. Let's read that again. The revelation of Yahushua the Messiah, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which shortly which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Yahushua the Messiah and of all things that he saw. Mm -hmm. Blessed is he that reads, and he and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, mm -hmm. for the time is at hand. Keep going. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you in peace, from him which is, and which was, and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. Seven spirits, which are, what verse is that? Four. Four, he said, the seven spirits which are before his throne. We're going to try to get into that, too. Let's keep going. And from Yahushua, the Messiah, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead. All right, the, the first of begotten the of the dead. dead. So we've talked, we, we've talked before, and we've called him the, the first fruit. So what that's referring to is that he's the first person that um, is offered new life after being dead. Right? Offered a new life after being dead. There have been people who've been brought back from dead before. But they didn't have a new life. They brought they were brought back into their same life. So he died, and then he was offered a new life. He was made a new creature. So he was the first one for that. And remember, when when we celebrate our first fruit, what we what we're asking God for is that He make us more like this. We have one this our first harvest that grows up, and it's the first thing to pop out of the ground. We take it and we offer it to God, and we're saying, "Give us more like this." So Yahushua was the first to, to do it, and we're hoping that he would make us like Yahushua, that we die, and then he resurrects us and gives us new life. All right? Keep going. And the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, mm -hmm. and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. All right? He's talking about Israelites when he said that. When he said kings and priests, I remember that was the prophecy that uh, Moses gave us in what, Exodus 20, uh, 19. We don't have to get it. But Exodus 19, he said we'll be a, uh, a royal, uh, a peculiar a peculiar nation. But he said uh, a peculiar nation of kings and priests, I believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he said a, king, a peculiar nation of kings and priests. All right, so that's, that's the prophecy that he gave us. And now this is what John is calling back to. He's talking about the Israelites at that point. Keep going. What verse we on? Seven. Right, verse 7. Keep going. Behold, he comes with clouds, and every eye shall see him. And they also which pierce. He said, he comes with what? Clouds. That sounds familiar. It sounds just like what we talked about in Mark. All right? When Mark, he was telling us, he is like, when he comes, son of man going to come in the clouds. All right? Everybody, he got Jay got done. They get to tell you, oh, lo, Christ is over here. I saw him. This and another. You're like, man, don't believe that stuff. When you see the son of man, he going to be in the clouds. And he said right here, he said, every eye is going to see him. All right, keep going. And every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. Mm -hmm. And all kindreds of the earth shall well because of him, even so. Amen. Say, even so, amen. Keep going. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending. Uh -huh. ending says the Lord, which is and which was and which what and which is to come, the Almighty. Uh huh. I, John, also am your brother and companion in tribulation, and in the kingdom and patience of Yahushua, Messiah. Mm -hmm. What verse is that? Nine. All right, keep going. Was in the island that is called Patmos mm -hmm. for the word of God and for the testimony of Yahshua the Messiah. Mm -hmm. I was in the spirit of the Lord. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. He said, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. 
and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. Okay, does that mean he is in the spirit on a Sunday? No. No, he said he's in the spirit on the Lord's day. He's talking about the day of the Lord. The end of the right? The things that we are talking about in Mark when he is like the sun is darkened and the moon is not giving her light. All right, and he said the son of man, you're going to see him in the sky. And every and right here in Revelation, every eye going to see him. It's describing the day of the Lord. All right, grab uh, Zephaniah. Zephaniah 2. This is Zephaniah chapter 2, verse 1. Look at that fat boy. It's Zephaniah chapter 2, verse 1. Gather yourselves together. Yea, gather together, O nation, not desired. Before the decree bring forth, before the day pass at the chaff, before the fierce anger of the Lord come upon you. Before, before the fierce anger of the Lord come upon you. What else? Before the day of the Lord's anger come upon you. Before the day of the Lord's anger come upon you. Keep going. Seek ye the Lord, all ye meek of the earth, which have wrought his judgment. Mm -hmm. Seek righteousness, seek meekness. It may be ye shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. All right. So this goes back to, to what we are reading before, where he's saying that, we're, well, I mean, what we were saying before, what we're looking at is we have signs, and our hope is that by doing the right thing, the Most High God will preserve us through these times. It, these things should give us hope. But for a person that doesn't obey, for them, it should give them fear. And it should give us fear to stay away from, from that type of lifestyle. So he's saying, those, who, those of y'all who seek meekness and seek righteousness, he said, maybe it will be that the Most High God will hide you in the, in the day of the Lord. All right, when you get to the day of the Lord, that, it, that thing won't be so hard on you. All right, grab, um, grab 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 1. It's 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 1. See, a lot of people think he's, John is talking about Sunday when he said the Lord's day. I don't know where they get that from anyway. That's just, that's just the myth. Even if you're going to say a day with the Lord, you know what I'm saying? The only one that you could say is Sabbath. He told you that yourself, y'all were sure. Told you flat out, he said, the Son of Man is the Lord even of the Sabbath. You ain't never heard him say that about any other day. I don't know how you get Lord's Day as a as Sunday. All right. But what he's really talking about anyway is not a day of the week at all. He's talking about the prophecy. He's talking about a day where it's neither hot, I mean, it's uh, neither light nor dark, is what the books say. This is uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 1. <clears throat> but of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. He said, you don't have a need for me to write unto you about times and seasons. Notice he didn't say, you don't know the times and seasons. He said, you don't even need me to tell you the times and the seasons about these things. All right, keep going. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief of the night. Uh-huh. That's why Yahushua was telling us to what? You know what I'm saying? He's like, you don't know if he's going to come when the cock crow. You don't know if he's going to come when which watch. He said, you just have to pay attention. Because he said, you, you, don't have, you don't need me to tell you about the times and the seasons. You yourself already know it's going to come like a thief in the night. That means you got to pay attention. You got to be watching. Keep going. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Mm -hmm. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness. He said, you are not in darkness. That that day should overtake you as a thief. That it shall overtake you as a thief. For you, it's not going to be like a thief, right? Because you are watching and you know the time and the season. Keep going. Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Mm-hmm. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. All right. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. Uh huh. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. Mm -hmm. For God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord, Yahushua the Messiah. All right. So this is the hope that he's trying to instill in us. We see these things happening, and we see all these prophecies, and he's given us the signs of that season. But he's reminding us, God has not appointed us unto wrath. 
These things are not these things are not for you to be afraid of or to to lose hope. These things are for you to see that maybe God will hide you in all this. Right? That these things are happening, you know they're coming. This is a sign to let you know that God is coming for you if you obey his word. All right? Keep going. For God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our master, Yahushua, the Messiah, mm -hmm. who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Mm -hmm. That's why comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even also you do. What is that, verse 9? 11. 11. Grab, uh, we good there. Go ahead and grab uh, Revelation 1. Let's go back. I think we left off at what, verse 9? Verse 10? Uh, verse 10. Verse, verse 10. So this is uh, Revelation chapter 1, verse 10. So remember, you just got done talking about he is in the spirit on the Lord's day. In the spirit, it's talking about what, T? Um, like a vision. A vision, right? This is a revelation being given to John. So he's speaking. And now he's letting us know on the Lord's day, I was in the spirit. On the day of the Lord, I was there. I felt like I was there. I'm having a vision of the day of the Lord right now. All right? And so this is what he tells us about being in the spirit. So people would call it like a premonition. All the future type thing. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. Saying, that thing sound like a trumpet, he said. What did it say to him? I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. Uh huh. And what you see, write in the book, and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, uh -huh. unto Ephesus, unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, and unto Thyatira and Sardis, and to, Pan and to Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. So the, the things that the places that he's naming are mostly like in the Turkey area um, where the Middle East is. You know what I'm saying? It's like uh, mostly in that area. Um, and the reason part of the reason is a lot of our people had to migrate that way as things were breaking down in in our uh, in our, our country. You know what I'm saying? So we started to migrate more north um, to get into those areas. And so there's there's already congregations established there from some of the work that Paul did that we just got done reading in Acts. And so these are the messages that he's sending to those congregations in those times. Watch what he's saying. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. He saw seven golden can candlesticks. And in the middle of the seven candlesticks, like one unto the son of man, clothed with a garment down to the foot and gird about the paps with a golden girdle. He said, in the middle of these seven golden candlesticks, he saw somebody that was just like a human being, son of man. He is like one, somebody who was like a human being. He had clothed all the way down to his, his uh, bottoms. All right, let's see. His head and his arms were white like wool. He said his head and his arms. I'm sorry, his head and his hairs were white like wool. All right, he said his head and his, and his hair was white like wool. As all white right? as snow. As white as snow. So, yeah, white hair like wool. Right, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. His eyes was like fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if the, as if they burned in a furnace. He said, and his feet were like fine brass, as if it was burned in the furnace. Where have we heard that before? Daniel, Daniel, Daniel's one. Grab uh, Daniel, then let's go. Grab Daniel chapter ten, verse one. See, a lot of these things we'll look and be like. Oh, he's talking about he talking about Jesus. Jesus got eyes like fire, and, and skin is, is 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 like burned brass, right? And when they say brass, what it's talking is what it, the the true word is copper. It's really talking about copper, right? So he's like he got he got skin like copper, right? Like hot copper. Right? So you look at him, we say, okay, let's take a look at it. Let's try to see if we can figure this thing out. Real copper too. They call these Indians copper skin, but real copper look like us. You can get it. You pull out. You pull out a bag of pennies right in your right right in your hand. You'll see some light skin ones, some dark skin ones, and they all that. You got all them pennies right there. That's real copper. Yeah, I said copper burned in the furnace, dog. So you put a if you put a lighter to a penny. That thing gonna be hot, and that thing gonna be dark, right? Let's take a look. Let's see where else we heard it. Cause we talking about Yahushua in Revelations. Uh, Daniel, we talking about somebody else. Let's see. It's Daniel chapter ten, verse one. In the third year of Cyrus, Cyrus, king of Persia, mm -hmm. a thing was revealed unto Daniel, whose name was called Belteshazzar. Mm -hmm. And the thing was true. 
The thing was true, he said. But the time appointed was long. He said that thing was a, a long ways away. And he understood the thing and had understanding of the vision. Mm -hmm. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. I ate no pleasant bread, neither came flesh nor wine in my mouth, neither did I anoint myself at all. Mm -hmm. Till three whole weeks. Notice he said, neither did I anoint myself at all. What is he talking about? He ain't put no oil on. He's just talking about pouring on oil on himself. Put on lotion. Uh, we'll look at it. All right? That's how, that's how, that's how, that's what anointed represented. But that would happen when we chose our kings. So that's why you would say this is anointed. A lot of, a lot of tradition itself, we lose the original meaning, but knowing our history, we'll see the significance. Anointing in itself is nothing but just pouring something on you, right? And in a lot of ways, it can mean nothing, right? But when we use it in our symbolism, we knew that the Most High God would command us to pour oil on somebody who we chosen. So he's just talking about just the normal anointing in the sense of just, you know, moisturizing the skin. All right, keep going. So he was fasting, and he didn't moisturize his skin in a while. Until uh, three, three whole weeks were fulfilled. Mm -hmm. And in the four and twentieth day of the first month, as I was by the side of the great rib river, which is Hadekiel, mm -hmm. then I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed. What did you see, Lord, Daniel? Whose loins were girded with fine gold of euphaz. Uh-oh. What did he look like? His body also was like the barrel and his face as the appearance of lightning and mm -hmm. his eyes as lamps of fire eyes like fire huh? let's, hear, let's hear something else about this man and his arms and his feet like in color to polished brass got that and the voice of his word is it like man. the voice of a he just look like some shiny copper that boy look like some shiny copper right and his voice, it sounds like a multitude. It sounds like a whole, it sounds like a multitude of water. Yeah. All right? It ain't sound like a, you got a river just coming down. Well, no, he said just like a voice of a multitude. It just said multitude? Yeah. And a lot of other places to say like Russian Multitude, water. yeah. So he said that thing sounds like a multitude. It sounds like a whole bunch of people talking. Right? That's important. All right, let's go, uh, where else are we here? Let's go to Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 1. Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 1. This is the cherubim you're talking about. Now it came to pass in the 13th year, in the fourth month, in the fifth day of the month, as I was among the captives by the river of Kiber, mm -hmm. that the heavens were open, and I saw visions of God. Mm hmm. In the fifth day of the month, which was the fifth year of King Jehoiakim's captivity, the word of the Lord came expressly unto Ezekiel the priest, the son of Buzi, in the land of the Chaldeans by the river Kiber. Mm -hmm. And the hand of the Lord was there upon him. And I looked, and behold, a whirlwind came out of the north, a great cloud and a fire in it enfolding itself, and brightness was about it. And out of the midst thereof, the color of amber, and out of the midst of the fire, also out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures, and this was their appearance. Uh oh, let's hear about the appearance of these four living creatures. They had the likeness of a man, mm -hmm. and everyone had four faces, and everyone had four wings. Uh huh. And their feet were straight feet, and the sole of their feet was like the sole of a calf's foot. Mm -hmm. And they sparkled like the color of burnished brass. Like what? The color of burnished brass. I got that. Brass. Every heavenly body we we hearing about, them days, they got the color of copper. They say brass, but the real word is copper. All right? That thing got the color of copper. You pull it, you just grab some penny pennies of copper. You just grab a whole bunch of pennies. You just see how many shades of, shades of copper you'll see. All right? Isn't brass like the same color, though? Not, not brass is a mixture. I think brass is like iron and copper mixed together, so it's usually lighter. Uh -huh. um, but they didn't really, you know what I'm saying? Brass didn't really be cracking into like England, you know what I'm saying? Like that time period. That's just how they translated it. But uh, but copper, you pull that thing out of the ground, you're like, you can't pull brass out of the ground. You know what I'm saying? You ain't going to be able to just dig up some brass anywhere. You got to make brass. You know what I'm saying? You got to take your copper. And it's either tin or iron. Probably not iron because iron is strong. So it's probably like tin. Um, and I think you mix those together and then it just make, it makes a, a metal that you can more easily deal with. Um, 
But you pull some copper out of the ground, you know what I'm saying? You're going to see it in, in different shades, you know what I'm saying? And a lot of times it's dark. Sometimes it's a little lighter, just like our people, all right? But you see everybody that they describe in the heavenly being, all of them got skin like copper. So where do we get these images from, all right? Where do we get all these white angels from, white female angels? All of them say you look like men, all right? That's what we see. It's, it's important that we have the imagery correct in our minds. Because as we start to see stuff, if we've been taught that this is what this is what an angel looks like, and this is the image that's in our head, then we get to seeing something that's for real. We don't think that's the devil, right? Because already Revelation is going to be setting us up. As we get through this, Revelation is going to be setting us up to let us know it's going to be demons out here doing signs that y'all should fall for, right? Just like when when he talking about, he said, "Listen, don't if somebody's talking about, hey, the Messiah is." Come in and this, that, and other. He said, don't believe him. You're going to see him in the sky. Had Yahushua not told us that, we might believe somebody telling us, oh, yeah, the Messiah this way. He in the, he in the wilderness. He in the desert. We might fall for that. But because he told us no in that, trust me, you'll know when you see me because I'm coming in the sky. Everybody going to see me. That's, that's the difference. Same thing with these angels and the heavenly bodies that we see in Yahushua himself. If some, something happened and they try to make something appear and we see it and it looks like what we see on TV, might well go with it, right? But if we got the book and it's telling us very clearly that every heavenly body that they describe, if they describe a skin color, it looks like copper. You know what I'm saying? Whether it's talking about Yahushua or whether it's talking about just the the the, the beast that, that got bodies of men, they got skin that's like copper, their arms and legs like copper. I don't know, right? It changes how we view things, so it's important that we understand that. Grab uh, Ezekiel 40 for me, and we'll get back into Revelation. This is Ezekiel 40, chapter 1, uh, Ezekiel chapter 40, verse 1. Your mama left. In the five and twentieth year of our captivity... In the beginning of the year, in the tenth day of the month, in the fourteenth year after that the city was smitten, mm -hmm. in the selfsame day the hand of the Lord was upon me and brought me here. Uh huh. In the visions of God brought he me into the land of Israel and set me upon a very high mountain by which was the frame of a city on the south. Mm -hmm. And he brought me there, and behold, there was a man whose appearance was like the appearance of brass. He was a, his appearance was like what? The appearance of brass. Copper again. With a line of flax in his hand and a measuring reed, and he stood in the gate. You got another angel that showed up, and he said, this angel looked like copper. Right? The man looked like copper. Right? It's important that we understand what we're dealing with. It's important that we understand what we're seeing. When we look at, let's go back to Revelation. Revelation chapter uh, 1. Then we was on verse 15. When we look at Yahushua... And how he's being described here, eyes like fire, nappy white hair, right? And if you look at the man's feet, his feet look like some burning copper. And his arms. Well, according to Daniel, his arms were. All right? You look at him, man, the man look like some burning copper. All right? We know that's our man. That's, they, they describe how he looked. This is what we, this is what we look for. Right, just how the book describes it. We have no other reason to look for anything other than what the book describes. A lot of people might say it don't matter. You know what I'm saying it don't matter if the book describes it that way. That don't make. It just doesn't make sense. How would you put yourself in a position to say something that the book, the God that you say, the only communication that He's giving us right. in writing? Right. How are you gonna put yourself in a position to say what He's saying don't matter? Like who provokes you to do that? Why? What the, what are you defending? Because you don't want to talk about race. We can't put ourselves in a position to, to be scared of talking about race. Race becomes un, uncomfortable, not because of something we did, because of something that was done to us. We can't, we can't put ourselves, especially when it comes to the book, where we can't talk about race and differences and how people are being treated and how people are differently treated and things that are unfair. That has to be a part of our conversation. It's what we live for. It's what we do. Right? We have to speak up for the downtrodden. That's what God called us to do. All right? Keep going. It's Revelation chapter 1, verse 15. And his feet 
like unto fine brass, as if they were burned in a furnace. Uh huh. And his voice as the sound of many waters. Mm hmm. And he had in his right hand seven stars. I remember Daniel when he described them. Daniel said his voice is like a multitude, right? Right here he says thing is like many water. Keep going. Yeah, what in his hand? Uh, in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. In his countenance was as the sun shining in its strength. Mm hmm. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet. As dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. He said, When I saw him, I felt like I was dead. He laid his hand on me, he said, Don't even worry about it, I'm the first and I'm the last. I'm the first of the born, uh, the first born from the dead, and I'm the last. All right, keep going. And I am he that lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Mm -hmm. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Write the things which you have seen, write the things in which you have seen. And the things which are. And the things that are. And the things which shall be hereafter. And the things which shall be hereafter. Three things he told him to write. He said, I want you to first write the things that you already saw. This is John we're talking about. Remember, this is John. This is at a point in life where, you know what I'm saying, I think at this period of time, our, our, this is like around the same time our, our city is being attacked. He's exiled. He's part of the exile. He got sent to Pergamos. So he knows all this stuff is going down. Patmos. Patmos, sorry. He got sent to Patmos, right? So he knows all this stuff is going down. So not only has he seen Yahushua, he's walked with Yahushua. He's done all these things with Yahushua. He's seen the things that happened afterward. He's seen what Paul did. He's seen what the other apostles did. He's seen what's being built, right? He's seen that. So he's saying, write the things that you have seen, the things which are, so the things that are happening currently, and also the things that are going to come to pass. That was the commandment from Yahushua to John. Right? So that's how we're going to try to try to break down how things happen. We want to look at what's already happened, what was happening at the time that this was written, and then we want to look at the things that have not happened yet. All right? So let's grab, uh, we're going to go to the next chapter. Go to um, Revelation chapter, uh, well, actually go to Revelation chapter 12, because we have to start off with things that have already happened. Revelation is not like an order. You know what I'm saying? It's not like it's not like it just take you chapter one and take you all the way through chronologically. So we're gonna end up doing a lot of jumping around. This is Revelation chapter twelve, verse one. And there appealed a great appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, mm -hmm. and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she being with child cried, travailing in birth, and pain to be delivered. All right, so we don't have to get it, but if we went to Genesis, we would see a prophecy from, or I'm not, a, 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 a dream from Joseph. Um, Joseph. And Joseph, what he dreamt about is, he said, I had a dream that the sun the moon and 11 stars bowed down to me, right? The sun represented his dad, Jacob, right? The moon represented his mother, right? And then you have the 11 stars who represented his brothers, the children of Israel, the children of Jacob, the sons of Jacob. And they bowed down to another star, which represented him, right? So when we see this symbolism that, that, that we have here, a woman who clothed with the sun, standing on top of a moon and had 12 stars in her, in her uh, crown, when we see that, it's describing to us his same prophecy. That represents Yisrael, right? So this woman who represents Yisrael is also pregnant. Well, she's pregnant, which, which well, what, who will find out is Yahushua. So this is something that's already happened. Israel giving birth to Yahushua, right? Let's see. Keep going. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun uh -huh. and the moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of 12 stars uh -huh. and she being with child cried travailing in birth in pain to be delivered mm -hmm. and there appeared another wonder in heaven and mm -hmm. behold a great red dragon so you have a great red dragon that's the second part of his wonder this vision that he has he said there's a great red dragon keep going having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his head mm -hmm. and his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth Mm -hmm. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered. 
uh -huh. for it to devour her child as soon as it was born. So a dragon was in place to try to kill the child as soon as the child was born. All right? But what happened? And she brought forth a man child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. Mm -hmm. And the child was caught up unto God and to his throne. All right? And so then after that, the child was caught up unto God and to his throne. All right? So you have a dragon who was trying to stop this child, and the child was caught up unto God and to his throne. These are all prophecies. Go, grab Ezekiel 17 for me. It's Ezekiel chapter 17. And the reason why we're starting here is because it's important to understand like what in Revelation's already happened so that we can understand the symbolism because we'll need to understand. We'll, we'll need to be able to identify. So if you already have something that happens and then the Most High God is describing it with symbolism, now we'll be able to compare it and say, okay, if this symbolism is describing something that already happened, we can expect this similar type of symbolism that's talking about the future to look a certain way, right? If he's talking about Yahushua being born and going up to the, to the father and sitting on the right-hand side, and he describes that as Israel giving birth to a man-child who immediately goes up, we know that's not exactly how the story went, but that's how he's given a parable for that and given a symbolism for that story to, 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 to describe it, right? And he describes the, 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 the great dragon as Satan, right? And so all the attacks and everything that was against Israel at that time is represented in Satan, right? But Satan also is represented as a, as a nation, so we'll talk about that, and then that will take us to the things that are going to happen in the future and help us identify what nations and all that good stuff. So we're going to grab Ezekiel chapter 17, starting at verse 1. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, put forth a riddle, and speak a parable unto the house of Israel. Mm -hmm. And say, Thus says the Lord God, A great eagle with great wings, long-winded, full of feathers, which had diverse colors, came to Lebanon, and took the highest branch of the cedar. He said, Put forth this parable. And he started talking about a great cedar. With, uh, and, and, and Go ahead, keep going. He cropped off the top of his young twigs and carried it into the land of traffic. Mm -hmm. He set it in a city of merchants. He took also the seed of the land and planted it in a fruitful field. He placed it by great waters and set it as a willow tree. Mm -hmm. And it grew and became a spreading vine of a low stature, mm -hmm. whose branches turned toward him and the roots thereof were under him. So it became a vine and brought forth branches and shot forth springs. There was also another great eagle with, a great, with great wings and many feathers. And behold, this vine did bend her roots toward him. Mm -hmm. And shot forth her branches toward him, that he might water it by the furrows of her plantation. All right, so we look at this. This is all symbolism that he's talking about. All right, it's a parable. All right, watch this. Keep going. It was planted in a good soil by great waters, that it might bring forth branches, and that it might bear fruit, that it might be a goodly vine. Mm -hmm. Say thou, thus says the Lord God, shall it prosper? Mm -hmm. Shall he not pull up the roots thereof and cut off the fruit thereof, that it wither? Mm -hmm. It shall wither in all the leaves of her spring, even without great power or many people to pluck it up by the roots thereof. Mm -hmm. Yea, both being planted, shall it prosper? Shall it not utterly, utterly wither when the east wind touches it? It shall wither in the furrows where it grew. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Say now to this rebellious house. Watch how he explains it. So he gave this whole symbolism of two eagles they, who, who took plants and put them where they ought not, right? And he's asking them, are they going to survive if that happens, right? Now he's going to explain it. Watch this. Say now to the rebellious house, know ye not that these, what these things mean? Tell them, behold, the king of Babylon is come to Jerusalem and has taken the king thereof and the princes thereof and led them with him to Babylon. And has taken the king's seed and made a covenant with them. He has taken an oath of him. He has also taken the mighty of the land that the kingdom might be based, that it might not lift itself up, mm -hmm. but that by keeping of his covenant it might stand. All right? So this is he describing what happened with our king, uh, I think, Jeconiah. Right? And he, uh, he took him into, into Babylon. And then we had uh, Zedekiah. And Zedekiah had an agreement with the king of Babylon to rule there. Right, so Babylon was in control of the whole thing, and the Most High God is saying, "Do you think that this will prosper?" Right, so that's what He was describing when He was talking about the eagle. Right, you had before that it was two eagles, so you had before that Egypt did the same thing. Egypt had a king, and they put a king in place with the agreement. That was the first eagle. Then you have the second eagle, which is Babylon. He's letting you know, "Do you really?"
really think this stuff is going to stand. But he describes it as eagle. Did eagles literally, you know, come down? And No. He was describing it as symbolism to describe an actual thing. This is what yeah, the Most High God does. Grab, um, grab Daniel chapter 7. That's where a lot of people mess up. They have, like the Bible is allegory. Yeah. But they don't understand this symbolism is describing something literal. Exactly. Exactly. And it's important that we were able to separate when it's symbolism and when it's actual, uh, you know, actually, he's actually saying something that's going to happen. What do you say, go? Uh, Daniel chapter 7. Just want to look at another example of symbolism. Just grab, uh, just for time's sake, just grab verse 15. It's Daniel chapter 7, verse 15. Watch what he say here. I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit in the midst of my body, and the visions of my head troubled me. Uh huh. I came near unto one of them that stood by and asked him the truth of all this. Uh huh. So he told me and made me know the interpretation of the things. Uh huh. These great beasts, which are four, are four kings which shall arise out of the earth. Look what he said. He said these great beasts, right? So we, we didn't we didn't get the beginning part, but at the beginning he described a dream where he saw beasts and. And the beasts were had all different attributes, and they were moving in certain directions, and and having you know they kind of went having fights with one another. The beasts, all right. So now he's like, man, I didn't get it. And now he is like, now these great beasts, they're what? These great beasts, which are four, are four kings which shall rise out of the earth. So he said the four great beasts represent four kings. So it's symbolism of a beast, but in reality, he's saying that each beast represents a king, right? What else? But the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. Uh huh. Then I would know the truth of the four beasts, which was diverse from all the others, exceedingly dreadful, whose teeth were of iron, and his nails of brass, which devoured, break in pieces, and stamped the residue with his feet. Mm hmm. And the ten horns that were in his head, and of the other which the came what? up. The ten what? Horns that were in his head. The ten horns that was in his head. And what else? And of the other which came up. And before whom three fell, even of that horn had, that had eyes, and a mouth that spake very great things, whose look was more stout than his fellows. Uh oh, he won. I beheld, and the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them. Uh huh. So you got this beast that has attributes of certain horns, and and other horns that are moving out of the way. Let's hear about it. Until the ancient of days came, and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High. And the time came that his saint, that the saints possessed the kingdom. Mm -hmm. Thus he said, the four beasts shall be the fourth kingdom upon earth. Upon earth. So he said, the fourth beast is going to be the fourth kingdom. Which shall be diverse from all kingdoms and shall devour the whole earth and shall tread it down and break it in pieces. Mm -hmm. And the ten horns out of his kingdom are ten kings that shall rise. He said, the ten horns represent ten kingdoms or kings. Right? So he's given us... He's given us a vision of something, and then he's breaking down what the symbolism in the vision represents. Let's go back to Revelations now. Let's go to Revelation 17, because it talks about the same types of beasts. Revelation chapter 17, verse 7. And the angel said unto me, Wherefore did thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and the beast that carries her, which has the seven heads and ten horns. Uh huh. So now he's unlocking the mystery for us. He said, I'm going to tell you about this, this woman who's being carried by a beast, which has seven heads and ten horns. The beast that you saw. I was, wonder what this beast could be. Was and is not. Uh huh. And shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. Uh huh. And shall and go into perdition. All right. So what he's saying is the beast that you saw was and is not. In other words, this beast at some time in the past existed or was around and is not currently around right now. So remember, this is John writing down things that already happened, things that are currently happening, and things that will happen. So now when he's when he's communicating with them in this vision, he's letting them know the beast that you just saw right in the future. Used to be, 
right? So before, in the time that John is actually living, he said in the past, that beast was already around. The beast is not currently around when you are here right now, but now you're seeing in the future that this beast is going to end up coming back. So this is the beast that was in ancient times that left, and somehow this beast is going to come back is what he's communicating to him. Let's hear what else about it. And shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. Mm -hmm. and they perdition that, being destruction. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder. Mm -hmm. Whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is? There's going to be a whole lot of people that look at this beast and they're not even going to know what it is. The ones that, that they, they name not written in the book, he said they ain't going to know what they darn looking at. So we have to understand what the heck is this beast. Let's keep going. And here is the mind which has wisdom. He said this is the, wine, the mind that has wisdom. Here it is. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. He said the seven heads on the beast represent mountains. What else? And there are seven kings, five are fallen, and one is. So the seven heads represent a land mass with a king. Okay? He said five of those kings have already fallen. What else? And one is. And one currently is. You have seven, and he's saying five of them have already fallen. You have one that currently is, right, which leaves one more king, right? So if you look at it from John's point of view, John is living in the time where who's, in, who's running the show right now? Rome. Rome, right? So John is saying, if you, have, you told John that, then you have seven kings right now. Rome is running the show. That one is. And then there's five others that came before that are not. Can we think of five kings before that that fell? Let's start. Okay, so we'll go backwards. So we get currently at Rome. He is. Then before that, you have Greece. That's one. Yeah, Persia. Yeah, Persia. Yeah, Babylon. You missed the Medes, but then we have Medes. And then Babylon. Yeah, Babylon. And then who else? Assyria. Assyria. The five places that took us captive. Right. That's five kings that were. This beast represents an entire 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 system right and on the beast there are seven heads those seven heads represent land masses mountains is what the book calls it with kingdoms and then it says five of those kingdoms already gone one it still is and it don't you know i'm saying we'll, we'll keep reading about the other one keep going and there are seven kings five are fallen and one is and the other is not yet come and the other one has not yet come all right, so that's saying something at the Rome. But watch what he keeps saying. Let's see. And when he comes, he must continue a short space. Uh huh. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth. He said the beast that was and is not is also the eighth. So he said there's seven heads, but he's letting you know there's going to be an eighth coming. So one of these heads haven't even came yet. And then there's going to be another one that already was, talking about John. Time. So one of these five that were already here, he's going to be gone and his butt going to come back and he's going to end up being the eighth. Right. So he's telling John pretty much there's going to be one more beast other than Rome. I mean, one more head other than Rome that's going to pop up. He has a short time to live. Right. Then after that, one of these old ones are going to come back. Right. One of the five are going to end up coming back. One of the ones that was. Right. We're going to get we're going to dig into all this because you look at it, you're like. What could this be? How could this be? But the only way you know that this symbolism matches up and links up to something is if you're familiar with how God uses the symbolism. That's why we had to look at Ezekiel. That's why we had to look at Daniel. We had to look at all these things to try to understand when God did confirm what things mean to us, what, how did it play out, what equaled what, right? Now we have that, that wisdom, we can look at it and we say, how much of this can we figure out? How much of this has God already really revealed to us? These are the people who have wisdom, right? He Let me unlock the mystery for you. If you have wisdom, this is how you'll see it, right? So we'll come back to that. Let's go to uh, Revelation 12, and let's get back to this, this dragon. Revelation chapter 12, start at 1 again for me. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, 
mm -hmm. upon her head a crown of 12 stars. So we know that represents Israel. And she being with child cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. And if anybody, when y'all look at, we're not going to grab it right now, but if anybody want to look it up, it's uh, Genesis uh, 37. Genesis 37 is when uh, uh, Joseph having the dreams, and y'all can look it up and, and read it. Um, so then what else? She was travailing. That means she is in, in labor pains. And there appeared another wonder in heaven. Uh -huh. Behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and a ten horns. A great red dragon having how many heads? Seven heads and ten horns. And ten horns. We read already about the horns, right? The horns represented kings. The heads we know represents kings in the kingdom, right? Our, our land, I'm sorry, mountains in the kingdom on top of it, right? So he has seven heads too, and he has ten horns. Let's hear about it. Keep going. And seven crowns upon his head. Mm-hmm. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them down to the earth. You have to come back to that, too. And All the, right, keep going. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was all ready to be delivered, mm -hmm. for, to devour, to, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. Mm -hmm. And she brought, brought forth a man-child. She brought forth what? A man-child. Grab Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 22. This is Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 22. Book says she brought forth a man child. How long will you go about, O thou backsliding daughter? Mm -hmm. For the Lord has created a new thing in the earth. The Most High God has created a new thing in the earth. What's this new thing, Lord? A woman shall compass a man. Thus says the he Lord said, a woman is going to compass a man. Thus says All right? the Lord this, is talking about, this is talking about the virgin birth, right? This is talking about Mary giving birth to Yahushua, right? That's why the book say she gave book, a birth to a man child, right? To connect with this prophecy, right? Grab also uh, Isaiah chapter 9 for me. It's Isaiah chapter 9. You can skip on down to like verse 6. For unto us a child is born, mm -hmm. uh, unto us a son is given, mm -hmm. and the government shall be upon his shoulder, mm -hmm. and his name shall be Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. All right, so this is the prophecy connecting us. So when we hear about a child being born from Israel and going up to the Father, we know based off of these prophecies that it can only be talking about one man. It's talking about Yahushua, All right? So let's go to Revelation chapter 5. Remember, he told John, right, the things that was, the things that are, are, and the things that will be, right? So all this so far, we look at, these are things that already happened. Talking about the dragon, talking about Israel, talking about Yahushua going up. John has already witnessed these things, all right? This is Revelation chapter 5. This is something that happened behind the scenes that John may not have witnessed. Verse, uh, yeah, verse one. And I saw on the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals. Uh huh. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? He said, who's worthy to open up this book and loose the seals off of it? And no man in heaven nor in neither in nor in earth, neither under the earth was able to open the book. Neither Nobody. Look thereon. Nobody under the earth, nobody on earth, nobody in heaven. He said nobody could even look at the book. All right? That thing is sealed up so tight you couldn't even look at it. What else? And I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. That thing brought John to tears because he was looking like, man, this, is the book. this book seemed important. Can't nobody even open it. All right? Let's hear about it. One of the elders said unto me, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the book. And to loose the seven seals thereof. Right? Notice the symbolism. The lion of the tribe of Judah. The root of David. 
Is is Yahushua actually a lion? No. Is he actually a root of a tree? No. All right, keep going. And I behold, and lo, in the midst of the throne. Let's see how he saw Yahushua himself, and he had copper skin, and he had uh, and he had long, you know, what I'm saying, long white woolly hair. Let's see about how he saw that this time. Let's see what he see. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain. He saw a lamb. This is the symbolism that the Most High God gives us. We see beasts, we see heads, and all this stuff. What he saw was a lamb, right? But what does Yahushua represent to us? Lamb. The lamb. So it's the symbolism. We know that this is talking about Yahushua. Watch. Keep going. As it has been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. So he has seven horns and seven eyes, which are representative of seven spirits that went out to the earth. We'll talk about the seven spirits next week, too. Keep going. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. Mm -hmm. When he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the land, having every one of them harps and golden mm -hmm. vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. Mm -hmm. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by the blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. And has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. All right. So he said, you made us kings and priests. It's talking about Yahushua. But the vision that he saw, Yahushua, was actually a lamb. A lamb with seven eyes and seven horns. All right. So when we look at these things and we're, we're looking at revelations, it's important that we're able to remember what the different... Um, what the different uh, symbolisms represent. And that'll help us to understand some of the things that are going to come. It's important that we catch little things that said when he's, when he's talking to John and he's saying five kings once was, right? One is, and one has not come yet, right? We have to look from John's point of view, not from our point of view. We have to look from John's point of view what was happening at John's time because that's why he started off by asking him, Write down what you already happened, write down what's currently happening, and write down the things that are going to happen. Because he's marking time with John, and that's the hint that we have to figure these things out. What was happening at John's time? Because when he says anything about what currently is, he's talking about John's time. Not talking about our time, he's not talking about anybody else's time. He's talking about what was happening when John was alive, right? What was happening at that time, right? We're going to go ahead and pick up next week with, uh, and trying to, we'll, we'll pick up from here and like look at, Look at, uh, uh, continue on. Look at what Yahushua did from this event. The seals were open. So the Lamb, right, in this vision, he has this. He has he has his book. He starts to open up the seals. Each time he opens up a seal, that's when everything get down. Like some type of plague hits the earth and all that. So we'll wrap around. We may not talk about that too much next week because that goes into the future. We're gonna try to cover all about Yahushua. We're gonna try to talk about a lot of these beasts. What these who they are um, and how they kind of relate to the things that are going to happen in the future. Um, so yeah, we'll stop here. What, any questions or anything? All right, well, let's uh, pray out.